Well, let's go ahead and um, get out your Bible and open up to Psalm 83. Now, um, tonight, because of what's happened this week, I felt led to just take a pause in Revelation just one week, this week. But we're talking Bible prophecy. And I want to talk about the war in Israel that's happening right now. And I want to show you in the scriptures that we are getting closer to some big scriptures being fulfilled that are pre-revelation, okay? And what I mean by that is revelation has a detailed blow-by-blow description of the last seven years of human history before Jesus returns in his second coming. So we're going to be looking at a lot of detail in those, uh, those specific years and we'll see how where we are today is leading up to it, how we're just moving in that natural progression towards those events. But we have some very detailed prophecies that concern Israel specifically and uh, some wars that have not yet happened that are not found in the book of Revelation that are in the Old Testament prophesied concerning Israel which I believe that we would be here for. And uh, we may be on the very cusp of it. We may watch this develop here in the next few days. That's how uh, intense things are. If you aren't in tune with Amir Shafati, he is uh, with Behold Israel. He lives in the Jezreel Valley. That is the Valley of Armageddon. That is his home. is the Valley of Armageddon. He is a part of the IDF. He was the mayor of uh, Jerusalem or Jericho, a mayor of Jericho, and he has uh, been a tour guide in Israel for years and now is a traveling Bible teacher and Bible prophecy guy. And uh, he's just the best inside minute-to-minute information on what is happening, I think better than anywhere. Like, because he is a part of their military. He's a major in their military, and he knows the inside scoop. He gave a blow-by-blow of the events that came down on Monday, and, and every day since, he has so much detail, and he will tell you what's going on, what countries are involved, what they as Israel are looking at, things that he's allowed to say, because obviously... They don't want anything slipped in advance on uh, their advancement and what's happening there uh, moment by moment. And so uh, I've been absolutely uh, gripped and emotional. I mean, my goodness. Uh, I think we all have as we've seen the footage and things. And so uh, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel was at a pivotal time in history, in prophetic history, and he knew it. He had seen the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon, but he also knew the scriptures. And he knew that Jeremiah the prophet had prophesied that Israel would only be in captivity for 70 years because they had desecrated their Sabbaths, uh, the uh, year Sabbaths uh, of letting the land rest for every year that they didn't let the, the land rest, they were going to pay for it in captivity in Babylon. And that was a 70-year sentence because it had been 490 years of not keeping the Sabbath year. And therefore, 490 years, uh, every seven years, not doing what you were supposed to do, brought them 70 years of captivity. But this is what it says, that uh, Daniel, in the uh, year of Darius, the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplication with fasting sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly 
and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face, as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem." As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does through, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day. We have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplication before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God. For your city and your people are called by your name. Lord, what a prayer to walk into prayer with. Oh God, this is a righteous prayer. This is a holy prayer. Because as we've already mentioned in our time of communion, no one is righteous, no, not one. Israel, along with the rest of the world, has sinned against you. We've broken your laws and your commandments. And Lord, we are worthy of judgment. But Lord, in your mercy, you have given us your Messiah. You've given us the King of kings and the Lord of lords as a sacrifice for us to pay for our sin. You proved this payment complete by raising him from the dead and giving us eternal life in him. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Oh, to the praise and the glory of God. And so, Lord, we want to pray for Israel right now. Lord, you've begun a new work. You have resurrected a dead nation. You have brought a nation that was not a nation to be a nation again. And in 1948, May 14th, you brought them to be a nation again. 
And Lord, the turmoil, the struggle, the fight, it has not left. The enemies that surround Israel still surround Israel in these very moments. And today, this week, the atrocities that have taken place by Hamas and those uh, who have perpetrated a plan, uh, some large governments behind them because of the power that, uh, uh, and uh, skillfulness that they have attacked has been beyond their capability of previous years. Uh, there is new advancement in their uh, military striking ability. There's new advancement in their technical, technological uh, ability. And so, Lord, we see that there are other hands at play here, and we see that there is a plan against Israel and against your people. And we pray, Father, as you have resurrected them physically, as you say in Ezekiel, you will also resurrect them spiritually. The days are coming, says the Lord. <laughs> when I will pour out my spirit on the house of David and on the children of Israel. And Lord, we're longing for that day. We're looking for that day. If you have been faithful in bringing Israel back as a nation, we know, Lord, you will be faithful to bring them back as your people. And Lord, to unite them as uh, under one banner and under one faith and under one king. And Lord, we pray that you would protect them until that day, that you would use the events, Lord, that were intended by Satan for evil, heinous acts of cruelty and wickedness. Lord, that you would use these events, Lord, and turn them for good. Not that they were ever uh, uh, good acts in themselves, but Lord, that there might be redeeming fruit that would come from them in the spiritual life of Israel, and in your church, that you would awaken your church, that the sleeping church would arise and stand for the truth and for what is right and speak out against these atrocities, as well as our nation and our people. We thank you, Lord, that America is standing with Israel today. Lord, that is a blessing. That is a huge blessing. We thank God that you have kept us, though we have drifted far as a people from your word and from your, your life, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would bring us back as a nation, that you would bring revival in our land, and that, Lord, you would raise up a standard against the coming affliction that is going to come against our people because we see that we have the same weaknesses. They penetrated the wall there in the southern border of Israel. Well, our wall has been, has been penetrated for years now. And there has been a constant flow of unknown people coming into our land. Many of them good people just looking for a better life, but many of them looking to cause trouble and bring a downfall to our nation and our way of life. And Lord, we're looking to you to protect Israel. We're looking to you to protect America and to bring revival in our lands and to bring spiritual renewal. And we pray, Father, that we would repent as a people and that we would repent as a nation as well as Israel, and that we would be drawn back to purity and true holiness before the God and King of the universe who loved us and gave himself for us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Please heal, please move, please redeem. We pray for the government, that you would be upon the government of Israel, that you would give them wisdom and direction. We pray you'd be upon their military as they carry out strikes, that they would be under your grace, your mercy, that you would help them spare as much life as possible. Uh, Lord, and especially to the innocent that have been victimized there in that culture, but Lord, that you would guard and protect them and that they would be able to uh, fight, uh, Lord, uh, for your purpose and for your kingdom and for your desire, that your will would be done in this mess, Lord, please. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for giving this time to pray with us. I think there's nothing more important. Uh, Daniel knew it. Daniel knew that it was when, when God says he's going to do something, that the most important thing we can do as his people is just affirm that in prayer and commit ourselves to his faithful hands. It's his work. You know, we don't have to uh, drum up the ability. We don't have to master plan the work. He's already master planned it. 
It's, it's our place to surrender to it. It's our place to ask God to do it and to, to, to trust him and in faith look for him to fulfill his promises and his work. And so we trust that God will, um, will do that. And um, so what we have up on the screen is the modern wars of Israel. And uh, I want to just build on this point here a little bit is that Israel is God's timepiece, his prophetic timepiece. He built his prophetic calendar into their calendar. Their religious calendar is only seven months. And that's God's number of completion. And so for seven months, he has the story unfold of what he's going to do in human history, what God is going to do. And it begins with the cross. It begins with the incarnation. It begins with the first coming of Jesus Christ. And and the uh, spring feasts are built around Jesus' first coming. And then uh, uh, the feast of uh, Pentecost is around the birth of the church and the new work. Jews and Gentiles alike being uh, brought into salvation Uh, through Jesus and and then uh, the church and its work. But then there's this long gap. After the church, the the Pentecost, there's a long gap, which is interesting because that's what we see in history. We see a gap, a long gap between the birth of the church and the new work that God does through Israel in the last days. Israel is actually a central feature in Bible prophecy. Now, Jesus is the central feature, and we will study that next week as we go into the book of Revelation again. We have specific scriptures to look at to see just how much the revelation of Jesus Christ is all about him and all about his plan. But I have to remind you, he is a Jewish king. He rules over a Jewish people. Israel will be exalted in the last days. Jerusalem will be exalted higher than any city on the planet. That's what the scripture says. And that the Messiah will rule and reign from that city, the entire world. And all the world will gather to Jerusalem to hear the Messiah teach the word. Isaiah chapter two is so specific. He will specifically teach the law of God and righteousness will we'll cover the earth and no longer will people have to say, know the Lord for the whole earth will know the Lord. So it's all centralized around Jerusalem. It's centralized around Israel as God's people. And so what has been fascinating to watch is since 1948, God birthing this nation that was not a nation this people that was no longer a people, bringing them back to the land as he promised a second time and then establishing them as a people. And they're only, they've only been growing stronger and stronger. With every conflict, they come out further ahead. Mark my words. I'm telling you right now. With every conflict, they come out further ahead. That's just a guarantee, okay? On the authority of God's word. The final two battles, it will look so bad, it will look absolutely hopeless. But I'll tell you right now, God himself will intervene in the second to the last battle. And the final battle, Jesus Christ himself will step foot on the Mount of Olives. He will rush in to Jerusalem and it will have fallen. Half of Jerusalem will have fallen to the enemy. Think of it. Half the city overrun and Messiah will stop it right there. It's going to be powerful. We get to be spectators on white horses for that one. <laughs> I'm so excited. I, I just, I mean, my goodness. That's going to be incredible. But there are three specific battles that are modern, that have not been fulfilled And there is a way to track these battles and to follow through with how, like, what's what. Because when you read the Old Testament, those who are familiar understand that you get glimpse and and, uh, uh, bits and pieces and glimpses of prophetic events. And it's not like you just pick up a book and you read it straight through. That's Revelation, okay? Revelation gives you a straight through run 
on the last seven years of uh, history before Jesus returns to establish his kingdom. And then it gives you a glimpse into the millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years. That's what millennium means. And then uh, finally, the great white judgment throne and sin and death vanquished. <laughs> Incredible. And the new heavens and the new earth, or as we've been studying, the renewed heavens and earth, because it's, uh, it's resurrection. God is the God of resurrection, and that's what he teaches even for the heavens and the earth. And there's lots of scriptures <coughs> that point to that. But all I want to do tonight is just lightly touch, because look at what time it is. It's amazing. Lightly touch on the first war, the first modern war of Israel that Israel has been already in since 1948. Now, there are good people <clears throat> who think that first war is over. It's ended. But I want to say I respectfully disagree and strongly say that it has not ended because what the Bible says about the end result of that war has not yet transpired. And that is the surrounding nations of Israel that surround them. And I'm putting this map up on the screen for you. Um, so you can see that since 1948, the day Israel became a nation in, in, on May 14th, here's Israel and the yellow nations surrounding right here on day one attacked. They attacked and they had an intense battle and God spared Israel and established Israel and they survived miraculously. I mean, look at how outnumbered they are. They were village people. They were literally kibbutzes and, you know, farm rifles. They didn't have... They didn't have military-grade uh, uh, weapons. They had just rifles you use to protect yourself from wild animals or go hunting, get yourself something. And they had to fight these battles with very little, but God gave them victory. And then in 1967, they had another big one. And, uh, and then God gave them the Six-Day War. God gave them victory, and that was the Yom Kippur War. And uh, that's the Day of Atonement. Now, here we are, and now there's 1973, we're not skipping it, but 1973 was another big one. But today, they are in the biggest battle of their existence, and they're saying it flat out. They have not seen a death toll or brutality like this since the Holocaust. They said, our people have not been treated like this, and the atrocities committed against us since Hitler. Now, Hitler and World War II was a tool in the hand of God. Satan meant it for evil to wipe out his people, Israel, and to destroy the prophecies around them. And God turned it for good because out of World War II came a worldwide movement that created the UN and created the vote for Israel to become a nation. Israel would not have been a nation without World War II. God orchestrated it so that the world had empathy, such empathy on the Jewish people and their plight that they allowed them to go back to their land against the avid, dogmatic protest of the Arab people. Of the uh, people in that region were like, no way. And they were saying absolutely no way to it. And then God, in his providence, gave them grace and mercy through the compassion of humanity. We're at one of those moments right now where there is a majority in the world that have said, Israel, you got to do what you got to do to get rid of your enemies. Uh, we get it. Coexisting with people who are beheading babies and who are killing babies in their cribs and raping women publicly and mutilating bodies and dragging them through the streets, these are not people you can deal with. Now, let's, let's talk about this. No, you can't. You, how do you survive this? You have to survive this in war. 
And what it's doing is it has mobilized Israel. They have been very fractured. They say, this was uh, Amir Shafadi said, they have been more fractured politically than we as a nation. And that they literally had riots in the streets between the left and the right. They've been having physical fights out in the streets in Tel Aviv and in various places in Israel. And this kind of civil war conflict has emboldened their neighbors. Because uh, what were we just studying on Sunday? A house divided will not stand. And so what has happened in this attack this week is Israel has come together and they have formed one government. They are not a split government anymore. We are one government if we're going to live, breathe, and and exist tomorrow. And so they are unified, and that's one fruitful thing that God is doing. They are now determined to eradicate Hamas. They have spoken out, and they are no longer being like politically tiptoeing around. They have declared for the first time in their nation's existence, Think about that. The first time in their nation's existence, they have declared war on Hamas, which is the majority of the Palestinians in Gaza, which is Lebanon and Syria. So these surrounding nations harboring these terrorists are now in the line of fire with Israel. And Israel's not holding back. Iran and Russia are, as far as, um, as, far as the, the, the intelligence of, of Israel, it's not a question mark. They are involved. It was Russian weaponry that was used this week. It was Russian technology that actually knocked out their radar system so that they could not detect the drones that were coming over their borders that were, had bombs that were able to take out tanks. Um, there was all kinds of things that happened with advanced technology that they did not realize the Palestinians had. They've been armed and trained by Russia and Iran. They've been financed by Iran. Now, that's leading up to Ezekiel 38 and 39 specifically, that, those two, uh, those two uh, powers. But there is a war to transpire that is local, that is taking, that's starting right now, and I think we might be just right in it. And it has to do with the nations that are specifically around them. And so I want to show you this in this map right here. I highly encourage you to take pictures of the next three screens. You need to go through this stuff. You will have an answer for people on the street that ask you, what's going on? What is all happening in Israel? These are scriptures and descriptions that will help you understand and explain today's events. These are definitely um, a part of this, what we call the Psalm 83 war. And I want to read it to you and uh, so you can hear it for yourself and and see that uh, God is doing something here. What he's going to do is he's going to advance Israel. Do you realize, we've already said it, Jesus will rule the world from Jerusalem. And it's going to begin with a local battle over the nations that surround him. They're going to end that threat. That threat will be no more. It will not exist for Ezekiel 38 and 39 to happen. Number one, no nation will help Israel in Ezekiel 38 and 39. They're on their own. Okay, right now, the United States has a naval fleet in the Mediterranean. Our largest aircraft carrier has cruised in, and we are making an open statement to the world that if you fight with Israel, you fight with us. I mean, it's just an open statement. And Israel is very blessed by that. So that's not Ezekiel 38 and 39 scenario, okay? We're still out from that, but it can happen fast. We see that. We know that COVID changed things how fast? Real fast. Well, so can the events that go on in our world today. There's just real real, real, uh, quick things will change. And um, the other thing that... um, 
that we're looking at here is that Psalm 83 war, I believe, happens first because none of the nations in the Psalm 83 war are mentioned in the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. Okay, so the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war is the second war that's still future. The first war is right here. Turn with me to Psalm 83. Let's just read it. And then I want to take you to a couple more scriptures before we close out the night. This will not be a thorough study on this um, because of time. Uh, but it, this it gets you going in the right direction. Are, are you guys ready for the next screen? I just realized. While you're turning to Psalm, I want to put these three screens up. Okay, the second war, major conflict is Ezekiel 38 and 39. So take a picture of that one. You can walk through that. And, and what you see here is um, a dear good friend of mine, um, Bill Hoganson, he's pa been pastoring at Calvary Chapel Anaheim for 40 years, uh, where uh, my dad pastored for 42 years before he passed away. He does a Bible prophecy, and he gave me these notes, and I went through them uh, a couple, like a year, two years ago. Uh, yeah, it's actually been two years, maybe more, and just was thoroughly blessed. Like, oh, I get it. What he did was each battle has a specific enemy. Who's your enemy? Number one, how do you separate the battles? Ask who the enemy is. Number two, what is the goal? What is the goal? In the first battle, it's to take Jerusalem. In the second one, Ezekiel 38 and 39, well, it's to plunder, great plunder. It says it right there, right there in the scriptures. The duration of the battle, short time period for this one. The other one's long and drawn out. Uh, multiple battles, multiple battles. The war is not over. Uh, Israel has been in tension and at war with their neighbors uh, and uh, for years since their existence. And that's about to end. I really believe we're that close. It's just about to be over. The victory in this battle is the Lord God. The victory in the last battle that we were looking at, the first battle, is IDF, Israeli Defense Force. The prophecies all are talking about their military power and ability that God grants them. And we'll look at those scriptures if we have time. Uh, and then finally, the last battle is Armageddon. Who's the enemy? The whole world. There isn't one nation that's for Israel. Every single nation will rise up against Israel. There won't be an American alliance. The United States will either be out of the picture or on the wrong side. Either way, it's not a good place to be in God's economy. And this is Armageddon, and the, uh, the goal is to seek the death and destruction of the Jews and to defeat, defeat their Messiah, Jesus. Because that's the end of the tribulation, the last three and a half years is the duration. Three and a half year uh, buildup from the Antichrist doing the abomination of desolation in the temple in Israel. And so uh, there's the scriptures on it. And what's the victory? Jesus will physically step foot on the Mount of Olives. He alone, the Bible says, treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. The blood will flow. There will be such a bloodletting of Jesus, just his massacre on the masses of armies that had gathered together to destroy Israel and to wipe it off the map once and for all. Jesus will do such a bloodletting that the blood will flow up to the horse's bridle in the valley of Armageddon, a 200 mile long valley. I can't even imagine the numbers of what that would take to get that kind of effect. But I will remind you, Jesus will be on a horse and it will come up to his bridle. And there are some powerful scriptures in the Old Testament describing his victory. He will be covered in blood. And the people will say, what happened to you? <laughs> And he'll say, I've been treading out the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. It's like, wow. Okay, those are the three conflicts. 
there you have it. And what is absolutely astounding is we're watching the development and the move, a rapid move forward in the conflict that has been in place since their inception, since 1948. The Gaza Strip, the West Bank, um, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq above, feeding in um, and uh, causing problems along with Iran. We'll get to them. That's the second war. You'll notice that each war, it moves a little further out. I can maybe bring up uh, this map here um, and kind of show you. In this map, the green is all Islamic nations. Israel is uh, by themselves in that part of the world. Every other nation around them is Islamic. And um, so the first war will, will be these local powers. Okay, Ezekiel 38 and 39. We have Russia and this region of the world, Iran, Turkey, Libya, and Sudan, and possibly Ethiopia, because it's the people of Kush. And the Kushites were a great civilization uh, through history that were in this region right here. They built more pyramids than the Egyptians. I've been watching Expedition Unknown. <laughs> it's hard to find good things to watch, and that's a good one, so look it up. Okay, so, so um, these nations are going to gather together in a coalition to attack Israel, and God's going to intervene and destroy them. And it's going to take seven years to bury the weapons from that battle, to burn the weapons. They're going to have fuel source for seven years on that war. Okay, so, but I want you to notice that all those nations sit outside of these na uh, local nations. And so these are the ones that are first going to be dealt with. And I believe that this war will help promote and provoke this war, this more extended war. Because the Arab world is just not going to sit back. The Islamic world, let me be specific. The Islamic world is not going to sit back and watch some of their people destroyed and be like, well, bummer. <laughs> no, they're a militant people. They're built on the ideology of military force. I mean, that's their history. That's their focus. They don't mess around. You speak out against them, they'll kill you. That's what they're supposed to do. Rape, murder, Mayhem, slavery, polygamy, that is all foundational in the Islamic books and writings and history. And so they aren't going to sit back and let these things happen without a fight. And that's what we're going to see is a rising fight that grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's exactly like the book of Joshua. When God brought the children of Israel into the land, uh, into the promised land, he, it's, it, he turned the hearts of those who were already hard against Israel. He made them harder and desire to destroy them. And uh, let me give you some scriptures on the last days because it's the same kind of fevered, pitched behavior. Uh, let's go ahead and read Psalm 83. Psalm 83. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. <laughs> I am a man of many words. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if, you, if there's a way to say it short, I'll never find it. <laughs> do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult. And those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. Isn't that interesting? They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation. That's exactly what these people say. That the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a conspiracy against you the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarites, Gebel, Ammon and Amalek, 
these are all nations to the east, to the east of Israel. So that's Jordan area. Okay. Then it says Philistia, which is the Gaza Strip, and the inhabitants of Tyre, that's Lebanon in the north, Assyria, which would include modern day Syria and Iraq, also have joined with them. There's a coalition. And they have helped the children of Lot, that is those countries to the east we just mentioned. It says, deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, as with Jabin at the brook Kishon, who perished at Endor, who became a refuse on the earth, make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb. Yes, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession. Oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind. And as the fire burns with woods, the woods, and as the flame sets the mountains on fire, so pursue them with your uh, tempest and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. Wow, wow, wow. Isaiah 11, Isaiah 11, I'm going to give you a running start. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again a second time. Notice that, that's key. To recover the remnant of his people who are left in Assyria and Egypt from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. So this is a worldwide regathering of Israel the second time. The first time was Babylon. God brought them back. Then the second time they were scattered by the Romans and have not been regathered since then till 1948. And now the regathering has begun and the nation is growing. My wife and I were there in 2004. We were there in 2019 and I was absolutely shocked at the infrastructure and building that has happened over just those 15 years we were gone. I was like, my goodness, they are growing so fast. It's incredible. So as God regathers them, it says this, he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Also the envy of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. This was prophetic in Isaiah's day when he wrote, Israel and Judah had been two separate nations for many years. And they had warred against each other over and over again. They were not friends. And so there was a constant tension and conflict. And when they were friends, God wasn't happy because Israel was apostate and it made Judah go apostate when they joined hands. And that's what we just covered in uh, Second Chronicles. Now, as we come to this prophecy, it says that there will not be two nations anymore, but they will be one nation. It's exactly what we see today. There is one nation. And so that was a prophecy. It's been fulfilled. Now, check this out. I want you to see, uh, let me get and go, go find it because I had many other verses. You know me, overly prepared. There it is. Isaiah eleven fourteen. This is just the next verse. But they, that is the, the, uh, Ephraim and Judah, as one, they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines. That's the Gaza Strip. Toward the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon shall obey them. Guys, this has never happened before. 
this is future and God is about to do it and I'm getting excited. Yeah. Isaiah 17, I'm going to read you three verses. The burden against Damascus, that is the Syrians. Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city. Guys, it's the oldest city on the planet. Damascus is the oldest city on the planet. They boast that they have never, ever in human history been conquered people. Take that thought in when you read this prophecy. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city and it will be a ruinous heap. Verse 9 in the same chapter. In that day, his strong city will be as a forsaken bow, bow and an up, uppermost branch which they left be, uh, because of the children of Israel and there will be desolation. So Israel will destroy that city. Check it out. Verse 14. Then behold at evening tide, trouble. And before the morning, he is no more. This is the portion of those who plundered us and the lot of those who rob us. And so this battle will, uh, that's being sparked could lead to this. Um, I've been, I've, I've heard that Damascus is a massive powder keg. They've got so much weapon arsenals hidden in Damascus that if it was hit, the whole city would just go kaboom. And so we'll see how God brings that together and what happens there. But um, one last one, we're, we're in overtime. So this is it. This is the last verse that we'll look at for tonight. Obadiah, Obadiah, verse 18. The house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau to their east shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them. And no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken. The south shall possess the mountains of Esau. Israel, the southern part of Israel in Judah, will possess the mountains of Jordan. That's what that says right there. Incredible. They shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria. Where's that? the West Bank. Israel will take the West Bank. That's what that says right there. Benjamin shall possess Gilead, the Golan Heights. Gilead is a, lar a larger area than just the Golan Heights, but it encompasses the Golan Heights and going north. And so it will go up into Syria. That whole area there will be Israel's. That's the promise of the outcome of this war or this battle that finally ends. And it's been going since 1948. These specific nations have never truly made peace with Israel. And they have said themselves, I mean, I've heard these guys, we make peace. They say this, check this out. This is, I'm quoting one of their leaders. We make peace so that we can get closer to you so we can use a knife on you. We want you to trust us to get close to us so we can kill you with a knife. They teach their children from birth to wipe Israel out. Uh, they literally have their map with the Mediterranean as red. And when the kids say, why is that sea red? It's red with the blood of the Jews. That's what they teach them. And these surrounding nations have never changed their policy or their thinking towards the nation of Israel. And this skirmish is just fired up more than it has ever been in the history of Israel. Yeah, I'm on the edge of my seat, and you should be too. We are watching these things about to unfold, and there's no turning back. I mean, they, they have drawn the line in the sand. They've got 360,000 troops, Israeli forces, on the border of Gaza ready to go in. They sent out a text today that said to all those in the Gaza Strip, if you are a civilian 
and um, you need to get out and move to Egypt now or you will die. That's what the text said. That's today. They are waiting for the command to go in. And they're going to absolutely take, to say that statement, what's the plan? They're taking Gaza Strip. They're going to claim it as theirs. They will not tolerate an enemy that close anymore. They said, we're done. We're going to remove our enemies who are close to us. Which, brothers and sisters, as that war succeeds, it will give them borders they've never had and boundaries, buffer zones they've never, ever had as an existence of a people. And what does Ezekiel 38 say? It says that the nations who create the coalition to come against him, they say, let us go to the unwalled villages where they dwell in peace. That does not describe Israel today. It never has described Israel that way because their neighbors are their enemies and they could never relax. They've got walls, they've got surveillance, they have F-18s 24-7, 365 in the air because they cannot afford a second. That's how close their enemies are to striking. And so they are not a people of peace, but they will be after this war right here. So Lord, as we're just getting acquainted and getting more and more familiar with your scriptures and what you say about the coming war and what's happening today, we pray, Father, that you would accomplish your purposes, your plan. I think of what it says in Revelation 22, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Lord, you are our hope. You are our peace. This world will know no peace until they know the Prince of Peace. And so, Father, please come and bring peace and see us through and help us to stay the course and not be sidetracked or waylaid in the things of this world. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Amen.